Um, all right, so these are the questions we're looking at. We're gonna do this big O one first uh, for our data structures and algorithms study hall. Um, you tell me, what is, how do I know what the big O is for a solution or a chunk of code? It's been a while. So the, the big the big O is usually like the like the most the, the the largest and most taxing way of going about a problem, right? Or is it like the most efficient way to go about? Not necessarily. Um, like you'll often report best and worst case and average case for any particular approach. When somebody asks you this question in the interview, they're usually asking about worst case. Um, but big O can be used to describe all of them. Don't you first have to ask if it's time versus space? That also matters. Uh, are we talking about how fast it runs or how much space it takes up? But let's take a step back from that. What is big O at all? It refers to like usually like a sorting algorithm and it's kind of like a I forget what the how to talk about. I think I think it's like the the worst case scenario is like o o n squared. I think because then you're factorial. O n factorial. But even before that, what is it? Just like plain English language. What it describes it? how time or space complexity changes based on the size of input. Bingo. How does the how fast it runs or how much space it takes up change as the input gets bigger. Mm -hmm. So if something is O of N, that means as the input grows, how long it takes to process or how much space it takes up grows linearly. For that even, we have O of one. That is, no matter how big this thing gets, it takes about the same amount of time. It takes up about the same amount of space. So examples of this might be looking up a key in an object. The, an object can have, like a JavaScript object, uh, since we're talking about data structures, a hash, for example. It doesn't matter if there are a billion things on that hash. Finding any one key in there takes about the same amount of time, whether there's one or a billion of them. Another one uh, from the space realm. Reversing a string, we got a whole bunch of different ways we can do that. One of them is in place. So you take the last thing and the first, the last character and the first character in a string and you switch them. And then you do that in and in and in until they either cross each other or there's just one left in the middle. It doesn't matter if that string is a billion characters or none, it takes the exact same amount of um, space, consistent amount of space. Yeah, well, let's see. Is that true? No, I guess that would be O of N. It would still grow, because uh, if you have a billion character string, it takes a billion like bytes of space or whatever. That, um, no, that would be O of N. I take it back. But anyway, that's a, a O of one kind of stuff. Constant time, we call that. O of N, linear time. Now, like worth noting, it doesn't need to be one for one. This could be O of 3N for every uh, input. It takes you know, three times as long uh, as much as the, as the input in processing time or space or whatever. That's still O of N. It can be a steep N. So like that could be that or that. Real steep or real shallow, as long as it's linear. So we don't care about coefficients and we don't care about constants, to put it in math terms. 
just shape. O of n square has that shape to it. What would cause something to be O of n square? Loop within a loop. Oh, yeah, exactly. Especially a loop within a loop on the same thing. If I have to compare everything to everything else, as my input size gets bigger, that's going to grow exponentially. If constant, linear, exponential. Questions about that idea? I would say that a lot of your work day to day, like your practical use of Big O, is identifying when this happens and turning it into this. So like really common example, so if I have a for loop inside of another for loop, most of the time that's going to be O of n squared. Oh no, that means as more, as like your app scales, it gets exponentially more expensive. That's usually the thing you're trying to avoid. Um, because at some point then it's, it's just eroding profit as you sell more things. That's the opposite of what you want to do. So uh, a common way to fix that is if you do two loops in a row, if there's some way you can not nest those, so that's like taking all of the prep you did in one and then using that work in the other one. Now you could say it's O of 2n, but again, coefficients don't matter. You have to go through it twice for every uh, input. That's fine, as long as you don't have to go over every input for every input. Other questions about that? Two others that are kind of common. In between these two, O of log n. Like, it's way less mathy than it sounds. Uh, it just, uh, you can uh, make that in your head. It might not have to be every one. It'll be some proportion of them, but probably not all of them. So our more efficient uh, searches, those are like O of log n. Because if like I have a sorted list, I can, and I need to find something, I can use those divide and conquer things. I guess in the middle, well, it's not this, uh, it's not in this half of it, it must be in this half of it. So I look in the middle of that. That's not every single element that I need to look through, it's log n of them. So that ends up looking like, There's also an O of n log n. Uh, 
Uh, this is, think of like a for loop where it doesn't go, you're not comparing every element to every other element. You're comparing every element to some selection, some amount of the other things. That's usually m log n. And I'll draw the diagram again. So if that's O of N, we know that all of the sorts have to be at least this much. Because you can't sort every, potentially every item of an array or a list or whatever without touching at least every one of them. That wouldn't make any sense. You can't sort something if you don't look at it. On the other hand, searches, we want to be less than that. Because if it's O of N, neat. So you look through every fucking element to find something. That is a worst case scenario. Best case scenario, we can improve on that with things like sorting it and divide and conquering it and that kind of thing. Big O questions, hit me. Can you give an example of what would be n factorial? Uh, shoot. So n factorial would be every item is compared to every item, which is then compared to every item. Um, so if you have five things in the list, it compares itself to four of them. Uh, and for each one of those, it compares itself to the other three. And for each one of those, it compares itself to the remaining two. And for each one of those, it compares itself to the remaining one. That would be n factorial. I will try to avoid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. So once you're given a problem and you start like whiteboarding it out, should you then maybe estimate what your like big O is? Or should you maybe pseudocode, code it out and then give a big O? Or like, when does it come into play? Or like, when should you talk about it? Uh, in an interview? Yeah, like in an interview. Sure. Um, I wouldn't do it first. So in our polyas four-step process, uh, do it in step four. So that's our reflection. So as you reflect on it, you go, okay, so I got it working. And that's always what you're trying to do in a whiteboard interview. Brute force it, whatever. It's obvious solution. Get something on there. Um, and then you reflect on it. And one of the first pieces of reflection you would do is like, all right, so this is really inefficient though. And big O is a measure of efficiency. That's how you go like, this sucks, it could be better. Big O tells us how bad it is or how much better it could be. So you could say um, that I, uh, all right, so I got this working, but it's O of N squared. So uh, if I wanna try to get that down to O of N, then I need to do the following. Um, and so then you might go back and rework your solution, but that's where you would do it is when you're done. So with that, how do you exactly determine like which one is it? Like I kind of understand the general concepts when we review them like this, but actually applying it to like a solution I feel like I'm a little lost there. It's, it's honestly just a matter of counting the loops most of the time. Okay. Um, and if, if that's what you do, like in your job search, you'll be fine. Uh, there are some like slightly more complicated nuances to figuring it out, but um, most of the time it's just a matter of counting loops. You know, okay, well there's a for loop inside of a for loop. Is the for loop inside uh, going over the same elements as the one outside of it? All right, well, 
that's a no of n squared. Easy. They go, all right, does it not necessarily go through all of them? Does it go through like some diminishingly smaller amount of them? All right, well, that's O of n log n instead of O of n squared. They go like, no, nah, no matter what, like it's pretty much just one loop. Or if it's a sequence of loops rather than nested loops, then it's O of n. If it doesn't need to go through everything, um, so like if you have a loop that has some kind of early termination in it, um, based on some changing criteria, that's going to be a log n. So you kind of just maybe got to memorize like how many loops for each of these? No. Like, like what it looks like? It, it would be like as you're writing them out. It's pretty rare that like somebody would ask you what the, what the worst case big O of like some established algorithm is. That's probably not going to happen to you that much. Uh, mm -hmm. And like the best case on pretty much all of the searches is log n. Um, worst case on all of them is usually n. Um, and then the other way around with sorts. So your worst case sort uh, <laughs> is, is n factorial. Um, your best case sort is, uh, is O of n. But we're like with all the good algorithms, it's usually like worst case scenarios n squared. Um, with like quick sort and a couple of like the really good ones, your worst case scenario is uh, log n or n log n. So yeah, like that stuff, you just memorize that. But like I wasn't going into like my memory banks. Uh, like some of that you can just log logic out based on this graph. Like, all right, well, the sorts are here and the searches are here. Why would somebody be excited about quicksort or shell sort or one of those things? Like, oh, well, it's probably because it's less than n squared, at least average case. Um, so that, that'll get you for that. Um, what they'll ask you about 99% of the time is what the big O of the thing that you just wrote is. And for that one, count your loops. Other big O questions. All right. More common data structures algorithms they ask you to build and how you how you do that with JS. Um Pivotal, Pivotal uses stacks in their interviewing process. They basically usually do. Linked lists are like the traditional like, oh yeah, well, do you know about this? Let's say if you could do both of those, you're probably in all right shape. So let's take a look at what stacks would look like. Um, all right, so a stack. So as a reminder, well, who can tell me? What do you remember about stacks? Last in, first out. Last in, first out. So whatever you've just put in, that has to be the next thing you take out. What else do you remember about stacks? Um, you push and pop. Yep, add add we push on to the top of it. We pop off of the top of it. Um, there's also one oops, called peak that just lets you see the top without taking it off. Any other uh, operations that we need to be able to support with our stack? 
<laughs> Length. Yeah. You know how, how much is in it? What else? Clear. It's kind of a common one. Just get it, get rid of everything. Um, okay, so let's say that that's our stack. We got a push, we got a pop, we got a peak, we got to see how long it is, and we got a clear. So we make methods for each of those. Push, pop, peak, clear. And then, um, so we need an underlying data store. Like, these exercises are like a little bit of like an intellectual, like gym workout in JavaScript. They don't mean anything. It's all objects. <laughs> so the underlying storage mechanism in all these is always some kind of object in JavaScript. That's not the case in C++ and Rust and like a lot of other languages. But uh, if you're comfortable with JavaScript, uh, I think it's a, it's good for helping you conceptualize how this stuff works. So let's call it the underlying data store and array. So we'll say uh, the data is an empty array. So how would I do push? TJ, give me some ideas. You're muted, TJ. So uh, just trying to remember off the time. So push is adding to the end of the array, correct? Uh, no. So like, it, that's the same word for arrays, but we're talking about stacks now. Arrays are a totally different data structure. We're still using an array under the hood. Um, OK. Because uh, we have to. But um, uh, in terms of a stack, it's, we got a stack of plates, push is putting one on top. Okay, and then pop is taking one off the top. Um, so you're, so you're putting an element on the top. I guess I'm, I'm just not very familiar with stacks. Um, this is it, this is the entirety of yeah. it. So we just need to represent this idea in code. So if I'm pushing, I gotta be pushing something, don't I? Um, yeah, I guess in this case, uh, either a variable, a number, a string. Yeah, yeah. so stack is not picky about what that is. Um, but actually, let me spot check myself on this. I was gonna say uh, it's an element, but I might be wrong about that. So ds stack. Is it an element? Vocab is like big with these kinds of things. Push, pop, collection of elements. Yeah, it's just an element. Okay, so we'll say we take in an element and then TJ, give me an idea of what I do with this element. Um, so if we're pushing it, we're adding it to the top of the stack. So it would be like stack plus equals element. I. Oop. So this is our data. All of our data is going to end up going in this. Oh, so okay. Da I did. I missed that. So um, a data dot push element. No reason you would know this, but you have to put this in front of it first. Okay. Uh, cool. That does it. Now, um, if you're doing this in an interview, they might go like, uh, cool, like that's cheating. You can't just use the push method <laughs> of an array. So how else could I accomplish this goal without using the, the push thing directly? Can you do by a selection of elements? 
see if it's empty and you're to whatever track. element is. Did you just do data bracket zero equals element? That's uh, exactly what we would do, except that's only going to work for the first one. Data gets an array element spread data. Uh, can't use spread. Too fast. Data dot length. Yes. That's how we do a push manually. Hey. It's, time for it's not time for switch fight, buddy. I'm teaching my class right now. Oh, he cried and slammed the door. Um, okay, so that'll do that. You also need to consider what returns from this. So uh, it could be the data, like the entire stack, like that. Um, it could be that, the thing you just added. I would say the entire data structure probably makes more sense. Cool. So we pushed. How do we pop Haley? Walk me through it. Um, we would want to probably do this dot data and grab the first element and remove it. Okay. How do we do that? Well, I know dot remove, but we probably don't want to use that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there's a way to manually shrink an array in JavaScript. Give it your best shot. Let's see what we get. Um, well, we know the first element would be zero. Oops. Well, is the first the top? That would be the other side of it, though. Oh, OK. So then this dot data dot link. Yeah. Oh, actually, I, I just remembered how you uh, how you do this. So, um, so that'll give us the element, and we can return it. But now we need to take it off of the underlying data structure, also, because popping doesn't just show it to you; it yanks it out. Could we filter the elements and pull out all the ones that are not? our element that we are going to pass through? Uh, super good guess. No. I'm going to say it's probably not the right choice. And in general, in the same way that like uh, you make me cry every time that you use uh, for loops and while loops and shit when there's a more appropriate enumerable, uh, algorithms are like, and data structures, almost the exact opposite. There are very few valid use cases for map, filter, reduce, like that kind of stuff. And in an algorithm, that stuff's almost entirely loops and what uh, naked for loops and what have you. While loops super common also. Um, so this one's like a little bit hacky, but it's this dot data dot length equals this dot data dot length minus one. That'll truncate off the last element. Okay, we popped. What if I just wanted to look at whatever's on top right now? Bryce, you got any ideas for me? Um, I would just return this dot data, this dot data dot length. Yeah. Works for me. Um, let's see, Ben Rowe, how do you think I clear this? This dot data gets empty array. I love it. And I'll probably return this dot data. Um, neat. Seems like it works to me. Let's give it a shot. Let's give it a little test drive. Um, so let's see. Node. Oh, fuck. How do I do this? I don't know how dot load index.js. Cool. 
So I should be able to make some stack new stack. Cool. Um, and hey, it's even showing me what's in there. So I could do something like some stack dot push um, Kyle. Cool. Hey, and look, and it gave me the uh, the data back. I could throw Brooke in the stack also. I can throw Ben in the stack. Um, all right. Hey, some stack. What's on top? Oops. Undefined. Oh, we probably should have done dot length minus one because we're zero indexed. You're beautiful. Um, yeah, I think that's right. All right. And then, all right, it's going to take forever. So, some stack is new stack. And some stack dot push. Kyle, Brooke, Ben. Cool. So if I peek, hey, Ben's at the end. So I would also expect that to be the case if I popped. So if I pop, I should get Ben back and to do. And if I look at the underlying list, he's not on it anymore. And if I pop again, I get Brooke. And if I pop again, I get me. Oops, some stack data. Nothing in the array. Oh, it was one that we didn't do. This one's like, Ends up proxying that. Ta da! That's what a stack looks like in JavaScript. Ask me some questions about it. Is that normally a mod three or four thing? Stacks? Nope. It's normally a mod six thing. It's not actually a huh? program usually. I see. Yeah, you get a nice big uh, computer science uh, route to go down. Indeed. Exciting. Uh, I, gave, uh, I gave all of you guys that on day one, or Damon did. Um, so everybody should have that right now if you want to play with the curriculum. But that's a stack. What questions do you have about it? Or just the idea of doing these data structures in JavaScript. Where do you so, encounter stacks? Um, where have you heard this word before? It's something you probably check several times a day. Stack overflow? Indeed. So uh, that's referring to a call stack. As you come up with like a list of operations the computer has to perform, um, you throw all of those into a stack, and then you pop them off the stack as you execute them. I say like, I have a list of chores to get through. And so I push each of those chores on the stack. And then I work some down, I work another one down, I work another one down. Oh shit, I actually came up with some other things that I have to do. That uncovered some more chores. But I push those on top, and then I work through those, and I work through those. Now I'm starting to work on the original list. Oh shoot, I'm adding some more chores to it. And then I work those down. That's how a call stack works. That's how your computer executes instructions. Does that have something to do with um, the way JavaScript runs in general? Actually, I lost my question mid-thought. Um, 
it's when it oh when it runs through the code twice like when it picks up what variables are being declared and like when it uh hoists your functions and things like that does that have something to do with it like trying to build a stack first or is it literally just trying to build out like what exists before it builds the stack um the the latter so yeah it's not like throwing any of those things this is before any of the execution starts you could think of that like hoisting phase of uh, executing a JavaScript file as more like the compiler reorganizing your code than using a data structure like this. I got one more for you. Yeah. So trash collection, when yeah. you reset this data to be an empty array, this isn't really with stacks, but on line four, does JavaScript just get rid of the, the previous array since it's not being stored anywhere? It just collects it on the next run through and throws it away? Um, highly situationally dependent. Um, in Java, that's probably a little bit more predictable, but you're right. What this is actually doing is this is a completely new reference Mm -hmm. which means that nothing is using the reference that used to be there anymore. So the next time garbage collection happens, it's going to free up that memory and like act, actually delete the thing that nobody's using. Um, and JavaScript uses JIT compilation, totally different. Um, the idea there is that who knows, uh, but the, uh, the JIT compiler is trying to do the best it can. And so it might, it'll probably free up that memory, but I don't know, maybe it goes, it uses more CPU cycles to uh, free up that memory than it does, than it's worth it to just leave it there because it's, we're not using that much memory right now. Uh, because like when you hear uh, old, old timey Java developers complain about garbage collection, the reason why is sometimes you'll be using like a Java app and it'll just freeze for a second, like just a split second, but it'll like lag a little bit. That's when garbage collection is happening. It locks everything down so you can't take any more actions and frees up that space. Um, modern Java garbage collection is way better and JavaScript garbage collection is a fucking mystery. Um, it uses machine learning and black magic <laughs> to do it like in the way that it thinks will be the least disruptive. Thank you. That stuff is like super advanced JavaScript and it's highly browser specific and um, changes over time, but can be really important for understanding the performance of your application. It's like there are, I know there are some things that you can do that will effectively break the JIT compiler because the Java, JavaScript browser engines are continually um, reworking your code in memory and they go, oh, that's the 13th time that somebody has asked for this thing. So we're gonna cache that and like move it up front so it works more quickly. And there are other operations you can do that'll make JavaScript's optimizer go like, eh, nope, uh, there's no figuring out how this is going to work. Uh, stop trying to optimize the code. Um, and so think, that's like things like uh, the delete keyword. Um, using delete on something like often breaks the, uh, the JavaScript optimizer. It goes, all right, well, if you're going to change the fucking structure of this stuff, I'm not going to help you anymore. But that, that's like mod 13 stuff. Other questions about implementing data structures in Dribble script? So let's take a look at the other one. Let's take a look at linked lists. So for a linked list, you actually need two different things. Anybody know what they are? Noid. Yep, correct. We need a linked list and we need a node. This is like each individual thing in a linked list. So linked list um, has its 
content. And it has, um, it has a pointer to whatever the next node is. That's it. Um, so we could do, let's see, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. So we can throw a constructor on this. That, uh, all right, whenever I make a new node, I pass in whatever I want that node to have. Um, and then we can make like a setter for that. So that'll be this.next equals node. All right, so that's the general structure of, of a node in a linked list. So again, vocab is important with these. Right. List. The um, Head, that's one that we need. And yeah, actually that's it. So if we make a constructor, uh, say like this dot head, so head is the first node in a linked list. And then for each successive one, that's how you add something to it. And you know you're at the end when like the next node is null. So this code, using this code might be some linked list And then we need some like original node to put in. So we could say something like first node and then, um, oh, we need a way to add to it. That's right. Okay, so how do you think this is gonna work? How do I add something to a linked list? Um, well, for the first one, you could do like this dot head dot set next and then put in whatever the new node was. Yeah, but that'd be only be for the first one. So like, so what that is, is like this dot head dot set next. That'll work. But what about for everyone after that? So we need to somehow also track what the final like node is. You are correct. How do I know if something is the final node in a linked list? You would have to like set it each time you add a new node or update like a value. You could. That might be like a super efficient way to do it. Uh, not allowed. Try again. go all the way through until you don't have it pointing to something next. Correct. So whenever next is null, that means I'm at the end. So what a perfect case for a while loop. So I could say something like, um, uh, current node equals this dot head. And then I could say something like while 
current node dot um, next bang equals null. And then I need to increment that somehow. And so I could say like current node equals, uh, so we'll do like a next node. Let next node equal uh, current node dot next, and then current node equals next node. And then, um, so then what do I do? So then after the while loop, you would do um, current node dot uh, next equals set next, sorry, um, and then put in the node there. Ta -da. Cool, so I do that, and I do some link list dot add. Come on, man. Write code much? Equals new node. Cool. Let's see if it works. linked list. Oh, that would be some, some linked list dot head. All right, well, that gives me that one. Well, what about head dot next? Cool, it gives me that one. What about head dot next dot next? There's C. So this is kind of like an array, but none of the stuff has to be sequential, like in memory. Um, so they can be splattered all over the like memory that you have access to. So that sure is nice, especially if it's dynamically sized, if we're adding and removing stuff all the time, um, then that comes in real handy. So other things that you would expect to be in this is probably like the ability to find something. And so, oh, I want to find something that does this. All right, well then you look at the head, see if that's it. Then you next through it, see if that's it. Then you next through it, see if that's it. So that's searching in a linked list. Um, you could uh, remove something. So that's, that's kind of an interesting one because with the, this linked list that we did here, if I want to remove something, um, I can either do it by content or if I just have the node. I go, by the way, remove this node. How's that going to work in a linked list? Set it to null. Ooh, so if I set it to null, now I think that that's the end of the linked list. Because we said that the end of a linked list is whenever the next thing is null. So if you're trying to remove the one that's like in the middle of the chain, exactly. you could just take out the null and then replace. I mean, keep pushing things backward. Uh, oh, yeah. So we could do that. We could have like, but that only works. Well, no, let's see. No, so that wouldn't work in this. We really can't have a null because no node knows anything about the entire linked list except what the next one is. So if the next one is null, I effectively truncated that list. So you would have to like, as you're going through the list, see if the next one is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. If it is, don't move on. And then um, 
set it to like the next next and exactly. that just would drop it correct and then like ahmed was talking about garbage collection is going to take over because now nothing is using that node anymore um and we have to be careful with that because and like we need to always be looking at that next node because once we once we're on a node we can't see back anymore there's no, uh, I can see what the next node is. I can't see what the previous node is. So you might end up in a situation where, all right, so I go next, 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 next. I find the thing and now to like make it match the thing before me, I need to go, cool, start over again from the head. Next, 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 next. And regardless, I'm gonna have to peek ahead to whatever the next one is and do them that way. That's one kind of linked list. If somebody t just says linked list, this is what they mean. Um, there's also such a thing as a doubly linked list. That's uh, next and previous. And then there's a thing called a circularly linked list where the end of the linked list points back to the head. Uh, that's an idea of how you might do such a thing in JavaScript. So with circularly linked list, like, would you need to have like the previous linked list as well? Let's see, is every circular uh, linked list also doubly linked? No, circular linked list could go just one direction. How would you be able to track where the head is? Good question. You still track the head uh, in the actual linked list object. And so now you need to compare a memory reference. So you go, is the node that I'm on right now point to the same thing as what I said the head was in linked list? That's how you know you're at the head. And all those little checks, like they take time. That's why, and same thing with stacks. Why wouldn't we just use an array for everything? You can do all the shit you can do with a stack with an array and a lot more. It comes down to like computing efficiency. All right, well, if I need to also keep track of who my previous thing is and my next thing, well, that makes the entire thing bigger. If I also need to keep track of like whether or not I'm currently on the head, all right, well, that's another little check that I need to do each time. If I don't have those capabilities, it takes up less space and it runs faster. Yeah, like I feel like this would be faster for shorter lists if you're trying to add things and remove them. But if it gets really, really long, an array would be easier because it's like, cool, just go to this place in memory. I know it's here plus 20 or here plus 100 or whatever. Well, it gets sensitive to the context. So, um, what are you using the array or linked list or stack or whatever for? It might be the case, like for example, a call stack, you would never randomly access something in a call stack. You're only ever working with the top of it. The rest of it isn't important. So we can work a lot more efficiently by using the correct data structure. Um, again, almost none of this matters in JavaScript. Um, JavaScript is too high up for a lot of this stuff to matter. But if you're writing a browser engine, like every cycle counts. Interesting. And so like for a call stack, you really only need the head because that's only where you're adding your movie things. But exactly. can you also then store like what the last one is? And that way, you know, the first and the last, if you ever need to take the last one out, but you don't care about anything else in the middle. Yeah. Gotcha. Exactly. Or a queue. Q is just like a stack, except uh, where, where you put stuff in and where you take stuff out are opposite ends. So you put stuff in the back and you take stuff out of the front. So like uh, to use a, an example from the last time we talked about this, uh, my RTD train schedule app, it's just, uh, it's just a circle. So you DQ the uh, front of your queue. Uh, that's the current stop that's coming up. And then you re-enqueue 
that thing you just took off to the back of this of the queue and the next time that that thing comes around there you go so i have i have a queue with 30 bus stops uh or, or whatever in it and they just cycle through super efficient Other questions? Surveys coming out. Thank you all very much.